So for those who have done the notebooks uh, in, in advance, this will look fairly familiar, but there will be a difference in that I am not running this, as you can see right, right at the top here, I'm not running this on the Cori system. Um, I'm gonna be running this on one of our internal um, servers at NVIDIA, and as a result, I'm gonna also show and highlight how this works without just using a single GPU, um, but how it works with multiple GPUs. So you can get a visual sense of that if you did the notebooks, but don't have current access to multiple GPUs. Um, but so anyway, diving in, as Vibhu mentioned, you know, Dask is a flexible library for parallel computing and it makes scaling out easy. And we have uh, you know, done a, a lot of work to support the Dask community and contribute into the Dask development support for GPUs, in particular support for QDF and enhanced support for QPy arrays. And so in general, there's a couple things I wanna preface this with. Um, Dask is great. It is scale up or, and scale out um, to many machines, but Dask does introduce a small amount of overhead. Any distributed computing framework will introduce overhead if your workload fits on a single machine. That's just the nature of distributed computing. It has to have overhead. And Dask is really efficient, so it's great. Um, but if your workflow is fast enough on a single GPU, or your data comfortably fits in memory on a single GPU, you wouldn't want to use Dask unless you ex expected it to scale. You would wanna just stay in the single machine libraries of QDF or QPy. And that applies both to CPUs and GPUs. Um, it, the same applies for using pandas and numpy. Um, with that said, there's a little bit of a benefit that doesn't um, come through on the GPU in the same way, which is when you use pandas or numpy, well, well, particularly pandas on your laptop, you can use Dask to use all of your cores, which might not already be happening. On the GPU, it's gonna saturate the GPU's CUDA cores no matter what. Um, so that's something to keep in mind both for CPU and GPU workflows. But one additional benefit that we'll see a very little bit of here is that Dask allows the GPU libraries to spill to host memory and actually also to disk, which I briefly mentioned before. Um, this is something that is fairly complex and it's, it's out of scope to go into the details right now. We can take discussions and questions about it later, but I will show an example of what that means. And all of this is controllable when you create a Dask cluster. So that's what we're gonna do here. Um, so right here, I'm just going to restart my kernel to make sure everything is clean. Um, I'm going to create a Dask cluster with a couple of commands. Um, so there's some things here that are Dask CUDA specific. And in particular, Dask CUDA is the, the add-ons to Dask that allow it to work well with GPUs, which we are working on upstreaming. And some of them have been upstreamed. So we're going to import this local CUDA cluster, which Vibu alluded to in the presentation. And he, you know, he mentioned how like the general pattern for Dask is you create a cluster and you scale it up. That is the general pattern. In this case though, we don't need to scale it up because it's just gonna use the entire local machine unless we tell it only use GPU zero. We're also gonna use a client from Dask Distributed. This client is how we connect and interact with our cluster scheduler. So I'm gonna fire this up right now. I'm gonna use a single GPU. And note that I'm also setting a memory limit here. This is a memory limit for the GPU, which means Dask is going to target keeping memory below four gigabytes on this GPU. Now, if work is happening and it's going above four gigabytes, that work won't be eliminated. What will happen is that work will be spilled to CPU host, you know, host memory, or other work will be spilled to make room for it. And then it'll be brought back into the GPU as appropriate. So you can see here that I have a client. In the notebooks, this configuration on, on yours has not been commented out. This is to help you access the Dask dashboard on the Cori systems at Nurse. I've commented it out because I've already got this up here. And so you can see that right now, I have a Dask dashboard up. There's a lot of interesting information here, which is worth taking a couple minutes to talk about. This is the status page. And by default, it's showing me, you know, a little bit of activity is happening. In this case, I don't have much going on in the GPUs, but 
it could show that I had memory already allocated if I had been doing other work or someone else had been using the machine. This would tell me how much memory is being allocated on GPUs. If I had already act, actually run any tasks, we'd see tasks here. And if there were tasks currently running, we'd see the stream as they go by and various progress bars. And we'll see that in a moment. I can also look at the workers. The DAS scheduler in this case is running and there's one worker attached to it. As Abu mentioned, we operate with a one worker per GPU model and I've assigned it to be using one GPU. So I have one worker and we can see that in this worker tab where I have one worker. And this gives me metrics about the CPU utilization, what's going on and all sorts of things like that. I can also look at a task stream, but not just the, the running task stream. This is gonna be a live version. This will be the entire history of my task. It is not just the current state. It is all of my tasks that I've run. And we'll see that in a moment. And there's a variety of other things we can get to, um, but in particular, some of the really valuable ones will be the profile, which um, will show activity in a moment. And that lets you see where time is being spent. Which operations are you running that are taking the most time? And there's a variety of things to, develop, to dive into. So with that said, that's sort of how the dashboard works. So we'll create some random data. In this case, we're gonna create a distributed array using the Dask arrays random state. And we're gonna do this on the GPU. So we can create a random GPU array by using CuPy here. If we wanted to use a CPU array, we could call it with NumPy. And I'd have to import NumPy though, but we could do the same thing. And so you'll notice here that, you know, with this generator, I can create a fairly large array of 100,000 by 1,000. And I'm choosing that chunk size. This is exactly like the example that Vibu showed when we we're doing like the small array of ones, the 15 elements. In this case though, much larger elements, excuse me, much larger chunks. And just as before, when we run this code, nothing has been executed. A task has been added to the graph. It takes a call to persist for us to execute this. And so this is just like Apache Spark. It's lazy execution. It's very common in parallel processing because it lets us do optimizations once we know what the full task graph is. So let's run this. This is gonna do what we just said. It's just gonna create some random data. Now let's take a look. So what happened? Our GPU is running the code and, and it's already finished so we don't get to see it really streaming. I hope you saw it for you know, a half second. You can see it and I can zoom in if it's not uh, big enough, so let me, let me zoom in. This is the random sample task. There were 100 tasks. All of them succeeded, they're all done. And now a couple things have happened. We've got a task, history, we have a history, and we should have a profile. We, we do, this tells us where time's being spent. So we can see that, as expected, we spent our time doing random sample. No surprises there. We had 100 tasks because this 100,000 by 1,000 array in chunks of 1,000 by 1,000 naturally is going to have 100 chunks. And we can see that right here. Dask provides a really nice string representation that actually uses HTML in notebook cells to present this. You can see that it gives you a shape of the array. This is a tall and skinny, excuse me, this is a, a tall and skinny array. The array is 800 megabytes. Each chunk is eight megabytes. It gives you the shapes, the counts, the data types. And you can see here that it's backed by CuPy. It's a GPU array. Now this is that visual wrapper, the representation um, is great, but let's do some work now. So let's actually schedule some work with the same operation that Vibu mentioned in the slides. Singular value decomposition is a matrix decomposition. And that ran instantly because it didn't actually do the compute yet. What we've done is scheduled work and we can see this very explicitly. Notice now that we have 708 tasks to do on, this, on these objects. Before we only had hundred tasks. Dask maintains a single task per chunk or per partition. And this makes sense. It has to organize and orchestrate it. But this actually added 608 tasks to our graph, but we haven't done anything yet. So let's do something. 
we'll call persist to run all these at once. And then we'll use this wait key command. Now this is optional, but sometimes we might want to wait for the results of all of these asynchronous operations to happen before we go forward. So we call wait, but it's not actually necessary, but it's a nice convenience function, at least in this point. Sometimes it's useful for workflows, but in this case, it's more of a convenience. So I'm going to launch this and go back to the scheduler dashboard page. And so a lot of stuff is happening. A lot of stuff just happened. Let's take a look. There were a bunch of different operations that we had to do in order to make this singular value decomposition compute actually happen. We called SVD. We called dot products. We had a QR decomposition. Why do we have a QR decomposition? Well, it turns out that a distributed algorithm for SVD does rely on QR decompositions. And you know, that goes into the internals of DAST. But we can see each of these tasks. And we can see in our task graph that they all took different amounts of time. Note that because I had a delay in running these, there's a delay here. But DAST helpfully lets me zoom in if I'm so inclined. And I can zoom in to anything I want and see, OK, this took one second. This QR decomp took. 500 or half a second. This dot product took a third of a second and so on and so forth. And then I can just reset with a single click. Very convenient. And the profile of course was updated too. Now time has been spent in multiple places. The time we spent with the random sampling is now much less than the time we spent doing things like a QR decomposition from the linear algebra library or from the actual SVD um, array, uh, array function. And, and so on and so forth. So that's sort of how Dask works, but now the results are still distributed. We can't really look at these results. You know, if, I click, if I look at you, it's a, you know, it's a distributed array. There's no more tasks waiting to complete. We're back to the 100 tasks for the 100 chunks, but I can't see anything. Well, I can call compute right now to make this array essentially one partition and just grab that underlying coupi array. So in this case, I'm just going to slice in and grab you know, a five by five slice. And there it is. So this is my actual coupi array that is these 25 values. And you can see that if I type type, it's actually my coupi array. Dask manages this and it knows what to do to give me that compute. This tiny call right here was my get item call. I was accessing those elements from those distributed arrays. And that's really all there is to it. We can do the same thing now, not using arrays, but with data frames. And we'll go through a couple other data frame examples showing some fairly complex operations. Um, so this is going to generate some random data frame data. And you'll see that we're calling functions that are being executed later. This right here didn't actually do any compute until I called head. Why did that happen? Getting the beginning, or the, in this case, the first few rows of a distributed array is not a lazy operation. When I call head on this object, this becomes active. And in order to actually give me these values, I had to do computation. That's why we saw this computation actually happen, this purple bar right here where I called head, and it actually, it actually triggered the data generation itself. So hopefully this is beginning to make sense where most operations are lazy, but we can explicitly force computation with persist. We can force computation by calling head to inspect things. But it's nice that we can do things lazy because it lets us optimize. So to make a more complicated example, we can take this data frame, which we can you know, see how long it is. It's, it's actually a fairly large data frame. And we can call length on it. And so you know, we got a variety of length calls. There's one task for each of the partitions. And in this case, there were 60 partitions, which we can see right here. Or actually, sorry, there were 30 partitions, which we can also get right here. And with 30 partitions, we call length, we get 30 tasks, and we see that there are two and a half million rows. So let's do a group by. This is a fairly large group by. And notice though, most importantly, it's the same API as we saw in the QDF notebooks. These APIs don't change at all. And also notice that I'm calling head here, which is going to force the computation to actually happen. So we'll watch this dashboard while it's happening. You see that we're doing aggregations across different chunks. We're doing lots of operations. 
we are combining, we're doing a variety of things. We didn't really see that group by operation. Why didn't we see that? Let's zoom in a bit. Is it possible it was just so fast that it seems like it didn't even, it didn't even happen? Okay, maybe we have to zoom in a little more. Okay, so this is an example of how using the profiler can be really valuable. We saw the tasks happen, but the tasks have, have gone away. Now our profile is a little complex. So if we want to understand, you know, how long are we spending in this workflow? Where, where's the group by time spent? We can dig into these profiles and we can see, oh wait, okay, I called group by, that aggregation, that took 1.56 seconds to do all the steps it needed to do to make that happen. There we go, there's our answer. And of course we had our results, you know, fairly quickly because this is on a GPU, we can do hierarchical multi-column group buys with multiple aggregations on millions of rows in you know, a second, which is great. And so, but when we, every time we run this, we're creating the data, right? We're running this from pandas make time series, we're creating the data every time. It's because we're not persisting the data. It's not cached in memory. So let's do this one more time and create the data. So now our data is in memory. Just visually, we'll see that this group by now runs way faster. Well, in theory, in theory, um, in theory, it runs quite a bit faster, uh, the aggregation. Um, I didn't measure it, but if I had measured it, it would have been faster because it didn't have to wait for this uh, data generation. But of course, the results are going to be the same. And it's the same API as QDF that works across multiple GPUs. We're doing it with one GPU here, but in a second, I'll show it with a lot of GPUs. Uh, but before we do that, I want to highlight another example functionality that's fairly complex that has support as well. Rolling windows. We saw an example of that very briefly that I mentioned in the QDF notebook with the user defined functions. We can do rolling window operations on Dask as well. And just like before, it's a lazy operation. And so if I don't call head here, it's not actually going to execute. But I will call head so we can see it. Uh, in this case, it's, in, it's incredibly fast because this is a very efficient um, operation. But you can see we can do these rolling window you know, rolling window averages and all these complex things with Dask. Uh, hey, Nick, we've got some questions in the chat. Yeah, go for it. All right, so uh, Remy asks, uh, given that Dask is lazy, why did it not optimize and persist uh, the DDF uh, data frame automatically? Great question. So Dask will not do that. It just, it's a design choice. Um, so in this case, I've already persisted the D this DDF, which is why this was particularly fast but Dask will not cache that computation if I'm doing it in separate cells. If I do this, if I were working in a Python script, it would actually, it would do that. Dask would actually um, not recompute the calculation, but if I'm explicitly calling persist and compute and things like that, it's not, it's not gonna cache it in between. And that's a, that's a design choice. Okay, great. And uh, we have another question from Taylor and he says, uh, does persist store it in GPU memory or DRAM? Great question. So because we're using Dask QDF, oh, sorry, DDF. Because we're using Dask QDF, when we call persist, we're explicitly putting data in GPU memory. And actually that question's a great segue because the next thing I'm gonna do is show that we've used data in GPU memory. This data frame, this DDF, as well as the arrays we created above are using this much data in GPU memory. I said about six gigabytes, that was my estimate before. Perhaps I have another process running that has about a gigabyte used. Roughly, when we use operations with Dask QDF, everything is being persisted into GPU memory by default. In order to use CPU memory, we have to explicitly spill the CPU memory, which is something we enabled in the beginning. And that's actually what I'm gonna show right now. Uh, okay, and I have a question. So I think at the beginning we set a limit of four gigabytes, right? And now uh, we've exceeded that. So uh, how did you choose four and why is it more than four? It's a great question. So I chose four arbitrarily. Um, there's a couple things in play here. What's, what Dask is using to make the assessment of when it should spill is multifaceted. One, at the high level, it's not using the total available GPU memory to decide, oh, I only have 27 gigabytes left, therefore I should spill. It's instead using the size of objects that it has visibility to in memory. 
So we've done a bunch of compute here and Dask has got visibility into the things we're doing. The data that's not in memory from this workflow, but is on the GPU is not visible to Dask. And so it's not using that information when thinking about spilling. That's the high level. A little more nitty gritty is that Dask is going to schedule compute in a way that it thinks it can do it in an efficient manner. And so Dask will go over that memory limit that we set as long as it thinks it's not, con not efficient to spill for that. It's not a hard cap, it's more of a soft target. And there's a lot of details that go into that. I'm happy to talk more about that at the end in the Q&A section because um, it's fairly nuanced. And, but it's at, at a high level, it doesn't have a, a hard cap. Okay, thanks. That's all the questions for now. Great. Um, so right now, the, the next thing I was going to show was sort of about spilling. And so you can see in this case, there's about seven gigs used in the GPU. We, I, I think that we've used about six of them. So we should start spilling if we do more operations that are very, you know, very intense compute wise, such as this one right here. So notice this operation is very similar to the one before, except it's bigger. Instead of creating a 100,000 by 1,000 array, we're going to create a 500,000 by 1,000 array with larger chunks. And so again, right here, we've actually not created the array. We've just made a task to create the array. And so when we do this, we'll see a couple of things. And I'm going to switch to the dashboard. And you should see a few examples of these things that look like disk reads or disk writes. These are going to be examples of when we're spilling. And so I'm going to run this right now and go back to the dashboard. So this is a more complex um, workflow, but you notice that there's suddenly these yellowish, kind of goldish, tan, I'm not really sure, you know, I'll go with gold bars. These gold bars are, are examples of when we're doing spilling. We were scheduling work to be executed that was too intensive for our soft target of four gigabytes. And so the scheduler said, okay, you know what? I need to do this computation, so I have to temporarily spill some of my memory that I'm holding into CPU memory or perhaps into disk, depending on how we configure it. In this case, it's built to disk. And then once it's done, it's going to read that. So you see right here, there's a, you know, um, a bunch of different things happening. And I'm just gonna quickly zoom in on a, on a portion of it. You notice that, okay, I'm doing a dot product, and so I need to do a write step, I have to spill. Then I do a dot product, and now I'm doing a get item. And now I'm reading data back into memory. Into the, to be clear, into the GPU memory is where I'm reading it back into. This is that spilling that Dask is handling for us. Now to be clear, this operation would have succeeded no matter what. We put, we put an arbitrarily low memory target, but I wanted to demonstrate that this is very useful because if you imagine you're working not with four or five or six gigabytes of memory on a GPU like this, but 25 gigabytes on a 32 gigabyte machine, it's very important at that point when you're getting close to the limit to be able to spill effectively. And so again, we can do the same thing we did before. And you know, we can do the same computations. These are obviously different numbers because this was a different array. But the point was Dask handles it for us. And so right now, just really quickly, I'm gonna run through the exact same thing, except I'm gonna use way larger values so you can see a significant difference in you know, compute time. With one GPU, you could have done all this on a single machine or a single GPU and it would have been fine. But right now, instead, I'm gonna use all of the GPUs and just demonstrate we can do a very complex calculation. And so you can see that I actually have 16 GPUs in this machine. This is a DGX2. It's got 16 32 gigabyte GPUs that are connected with NV links, and actually all of those are connected with an NV switch. I'm gonna create a cluster using all of them, and I'm not gonna use a memory limit. I'm just going to ignore that, and I'm gonna set a scratch space directory, which is just good practice. This is not necessary, but I'm just gonna do it to be nice to this machine. I'm not going to have scratch space be on a shared file system. I'm gonna put it on you know, a place that I know is not a shared file system to be considerate. So this is gonna do a couple of things. It's going to spin up a new cluster, which you'll see is gonna have a different number of workers. And the profile, of course, will be empty. So I'm gonna to go to the workers, and you'll see that it's gonna spin up 16 workers. So we're gonna eventually see the number 16 and all the different machines coming. And I'm gonna skip this right here and just go all the way back down to the very bottom where we do this 
large SVD again. And actually, I probably have to import the libraries. Actually, I think we're good. I'll skip down to this once this is ready. And you'll see that you know, we've got 16 GPUs here. Each one is an independent worker coordinated by the scheduler. Note that the scheduler is running on the same node as these because it's a single node. That's something, you can, that's something you can do in a multi-node setup as well. And I'm going to ex just expand this significantly. And so right now, you'll see I have very little going on in these GPUs. In fact, I have a tiny bit of memory used because I have a CUDF, which is that CUDA data frame. I have a context going on, or I have a, a GPU context for Dask. And instead of this array, I'm going to make a bigger array, maybe a 5 million by 1,000 with perhaps even larger chunks. I have to import the task array. Sorry about that. So you'll see here, this is, this is a large array. It's not enormous. I have a lot of GPUs, but it's still 40 gigabytes. This is too much data for a single GPU right now, unless you're on one of the very, very large Quadro GPUs. And these are big chunks. So let's see what happens if I actually run this. We'll get a sense of really what's, what's going on here. And so you can see that we've got a lot more tasks. We have 700 tasks. And this, this operation, it's scheduling these tasks. It's then going to run them. And it's going to run them across the 16 GPUs. And so actually, this one is too, this is not enough. It's too fast. But you can see it, it did this whole thing in you know, about 10 to you know, about 15 seconds. Notice that tr those transfers at the end. This is exactly what uh, Vibu was mentioning when he was showing that example of how if we use the unified communication X protocol, UCX, these transfers can be much faster. But you can see that we were able to use all of the GPUs to calculate a very large, very large matrix decomposition in about 10 to 15 seconds, which is great. And if we wanted to get the results, we could just get them. They're right there. The same code goes one GPU, 16 GPUs, and the same code goes multi-node if we had multiple of these machines. That's the power of Dask. And so hopefully this has been a good introduction. For those of you who had a chance to go through this, hopefully it was nice to see it running on multiple machines. There's also you know, a lot of value in the profile. And again, it's out of scope and we don't have enough time to go in depth about the profile here. But in general, this profile is, is the first place to look when you're looking at workflows with Dask and understanding where is time being spent? Where should I spend my time optimizing things? Where am I perhaps doing things inefficiently? You know, in this case, if we were the, all the Dask developers and we were all coming together to say, the most important thing we can do in the next Dask release, let's say, is to make our SVD computation better and more efficient. If that was our goal, the first thing we'd want to do is understand where is time being spent? And, you know, the SVD computation is all happening right here. Um, I hope you can read this. I apologize. It's happening in these dot products and these wrapped QR decompositions. And it looks like about 20% of the, of the, you know, of the total time in this workflow was spent there. 38% there. The rest of it was on data generations. So let's not worry about that. But it's pretty clear that we spent twice as much time doing the QR decomps than we spent doing the dot products. So that's informative, inf that's in informative for us to think about, are there opportunities to optimize? We don't want to waste time optimizing things that don't contribute meaningfully to the workflow. And it turns out, actually, a lot of the time we spent in the QR decomposition was in not just the actual QR operation. It meant it was spent doing other things, perhaps deserializing, serializing data, and other things like that. These are things we can look at in different parts of the profile, um, in particular in the administrative profile, which um, I think is something that is more advanced usage. So I'm not going to go into it now, but I'm happy to take questions and, and talk about that later. Um, one last thing, Dask provides the task graph. This was the task graph. Um, notice that, as Zabu mentioned earlier, when a task is released from memory, it goes blue. When it's held in memory, it's in red. And in this case, we only have that final result in memory because we finished our tasks. But if I were to run this again, you could actually see live, this will update. And we'll see how things are going. And so this is being held. And it's because this is the stage we're communicating results, presumably. And okay, now it's finished. But conceptually, this is why things get held often. We often need to hold them for downstream computation. And that's Dask in a nutshell. I'm happy to take questions now. I believe we have a brief break.
um, and then we go into another section. Um, I may be wrong about that, but happy to take more questions about DAS. Uh, thanks, Nick. That was great. Um, no questions at the moment, but feel free to ask everyone via chat if, if you have any. Uh, if no one has any, I have one. Uh, so how much code do you need to change to target uh, eight GPUs instead of one, for example? Great question. Um, so actually, let me, I shouldn't have gotten rid of Chrome. Um, we actually don't have a break coming up anyway, so that's okay. Um, but the answer to that question is very little. So Dask right now has 16 workers because I set up a cluster that has 16 workers. So in this case, I can set up a cluster that has eight workers. And so you know, I can do this manually by typing out the GPUs I want. Maybe I don't want GPU three. Maybe I only want GPUs zero, one, two, and I want GPUs you know, seven, eight, nine, et cetera. This is how you would set that up. Um, you obviously could do this, you know, much faster if you did like, you know, range eight, but conceptually, this is exactly how you do it. And when you do this, Dask will choose the GPUs that you tell it to choose for workers. Okay, what if I had, uh, let's say, two CPUs and eight GPUs? Is it smart enough to share between the CPUs? It's a good question. So currently, right now, Dask local CUDA cluster is going to use the CPUs available for spilling, but it's not going to use the CPUs available for compute. So if you're, if you're thinking about a world in which we have these eight GPUs and we have these various CPUs as well, the, the single cluster is not going to be able to use, for example, you know, 40 threads per CPU core and the eight GPUs. Um, that's a more advanced operation. As a, as a baseline, it's going to use the CPUs available for spilling, if that's necessary, but it's going to focus its work on only doing compute on GPUs. Okay, cool. Um, and we have a question from Paul. So Paul says he has a memory error running the last line of a notebook. He wants to know, is there a way to manually free memory using Dask? There is a way, uh, good question. So perhaps there's a memory error because um, there was slightly more data than you know, could fit in, the, in, the, in GPU memory or the computation spiked memory slightly more than expected or the GPU was shared or there were already objects in memory. I can free this memory explicitly. Um, now working in Jupyter Notebooks, many of you probably have experienced this, it's a little bit more difficult to free memory because Jupyter holds on to references. But in general, I can free the memory associated with this Oh, I, sorry, I killed my kernel, but I can free the memory associated with this U array that you know, we know is fairly large, or the X array that was 40 gigabytes, by simply calling del X, just like you would normally do. This will trigger the garbage collection for Python and Dask. Now, because it's Jupyter, you actually might need to also delete some of like, the, the hanging references, um, but in general, that's how you do it. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Nick. That's all the questions at the moment. Great.